um, special assistant for the U.S. Attorney uh, for the District of Columbia. He was appointed as a tax division liaison to the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force in the Pacific region, for which he helped to prosecute large narcotics trafficking rings. Also during this time, he was, the, he was detailed to Sierra Leone to conduct post-Civil War justice assessments for the Department of Justice overseas, his Office of Overseas uh, prosecu Prosecuting uh, Development Assistance and Training. In 2003, he joined the Criminal Division Office for Special Investigations where he helped to investigate and prosecute Nazi war criminals and modern human rights advise, uh, and violators. Gregory has been uh, quoted all over the media, widely uh, published. He's publishing a new book uh, coming out soon. I hear rumors from Oxford University Press, but I'm not sure. Um, and I, I'll just say one other thing. I, I can go on and read for an hour his resume, which I won't. But I'll just say that on some of the issues that are uh, important to our center, looking at radical Islam and the ideology of radical Islam, and certainly the, uh, the Iranian revolutionary regime's ideology, uh, Greg has been instrumental in his work on incitement to genocide, and some of the people in our community that we hear speak about the issues, like Dershowitz and Kotler and El Ouzel, it's this guy that did the, uh, the legwork, uh, sort of behind the scenes quietly in North Dakota, uh, on these issues that have resonated internationally. So on that score, it's especially also gratifying to have you here. And today, Greg will uh, speak about domestic issues. As Greg pointed out yesterday, ISGAP looks at uh, issues of anti-Semitism globally. Uh, we're certainly concerned about radical Islam and the what's changing in Europe and the silence in the West, particularly among scholars and, and the media, uh, media of record. Uh, but often that's overlooked to some of the domestic uh, situations. And, and Greg has a very important and uh, interesting case study of things that are shifting uh, kind of right below our noses here. Thank you. Thank you, Charles, for that generous um, introduction. And um, I'm honored again to be among you. Um, and uh, yesterday uh, to have had the uh, pleasure as well to present with uh, Professor Meekman from Yad Vashem. Um, today, um, I'm going to talk again about the enemy within a neo-Nazi takeover in the American heartland. Um, as a resident of North Dakota, this is an issue that has become incredibly important to me. I normally focus on international issues. I am an international criminal law expert. Um, but I could not turn my eyes away from what was happening in my own state, and that is the genesis of this. As well, um, as Charles pointed out, this gap focuses so much on the new anti-Semitism, uh, the idea of communicating uh, socially acceptable, in, in quotation marks, Jew hatred by attacks on Israel throughout the world. But uh, the old anti-Semitism continues to thrive right here in this gap's home country, in the United States, by various neo-Nazi groups including the National Socialist Movement, which I'll be talking a lot about, and the creativity religion. And it's kind of come to a new level of threat, in my opinion, through what's known as the Pioneer Little Europe Movement, which tries to establish uh, white supremacist enclaves that would exclude Jews and blacks and other minorities in them, uh, in the effort, of course, to try to turn the United States into, uh, if you will, the Fourth Reich. Um, and so I think, you know, this series, of, I, I think this is still part, I'm, I'm going to assume this is still part of the anti-Semitism and Comparative Perspective seminar series. This is just another presentation within it. And so I think it's, it's fitting that we explore this issue here uh, as it's not something that ISCAP normally focuses on. Um, again, why am I so concerned about this issue? It's affected my home state. There has been a movement in the town of Leith, North Dakota, to take over the town by neo-Nazis and create one of these pioneer little Europe enclaves. And so what I want to talk about today is partly historical, um, partly uh, a question of bringing to light current events, but I also want to talk about some of the legal issues. Uh, as I am a law professor, uh, that's inevitably where my mind uh, goes. And I find that the situation is unacceptable, and I wonder if it can be stopped. And 
what could we do from a legal perspective, perhaps, to thwart this movement? Um, and if, if not, um, you know, what, what, what could be the consequences? So what I propose is, um, first of all, to talk a little bit about uh, really what is the history of the American Nazi movement. Um, but I'll focus in particular on the National Socialist Movement and the Creativity Movement in the American heartland. Then I'll talk about this more recent development of the Pioneer Little Europe Movement, and then focus specifically how, on how that has affected Leap North Dakota and has gotten the state of North Dakota into uh, quite uh, a precarious uh, position. Um, and how the state and you know, to some extent, how some legal scholars have proposed that we can deal with this. Um, and finally, uh, why this issue is so important. And in terms of how we can deal with it, I want to talk about the problems that exist in the current law, but I also want to talk about reforms that we can make. And as you all know, um, from what Charles said, my expertise is international hate speech law. And so it's gratifying to some extent for me to take that expertise and talk about domestic hate speech and how we might change our laws to some extent to be in accord with international hate speech law. Let me start with, if you will, and I say this in quotation marks, the uh, religious side of things, uh, the creativity movement, uh, the latest of uh, several incarnations of a, of a racist group that purports to be a religion uh, that was originally called the Church of the Creator. It was founded in 1973 by neo-Nazi Ben Klassen. And the movement promotes what it sees as the inherently or the inherent superiority uh, and what it calls creativity of the white race. Um, the, it's hard to call this a theology, and later on I'm going to talk about what the uh, Supreme Court has said constitutes a religion, and I'm going to argue that I don't think this is a religion. Um, but uh, if you want to call it a theology, um, it, it, it focuses on Jews and non-whites uh, being what they call mud races, um, and they, they, they view Jews as sort of the leader of these mud races, uh, that they have an intent on subjugating whites. Um, and so their credo is, and their, their goal is to destroy and banish all Jewish thought and influence uh, from our society. It was interesting yesterday to hear Professor Hickman talk about how the Holocaust was about just that, banishing Jewish thought and influence from society not just the physical destruction of the Jews, and we see that here. Um, many of these neo-Nazis uh, meet on timely ends, um, as perhaps as befitting their activities. And Klassen committed suicide in 1993. Uh, the Church of the Creator almost folded, but it was brought back by a, an infamous individual, some of you may have heard of him, uh, by the name of Matt Hale. Um, and he resurrected the group and renamed it the World Church of the Creator. Uh, and in the process gave himself the title of Pontificus, of Pontifex Maximus, meaning high, high priest. Um, there he is with the, uh, the logo of the group, uh, which as you can see with the W, uh, is all about how the white race is superior to every other race. Unfortunately for Hale, there was another group, uh, a church in the Pacific Northwest, that had previously trademarked this name. And so they sued Hale. And um, the judge who presided over this case, Judge Joan Lefkow, who was married to a Jewish man, ruled in the non-racist church's behalf, which infuriated Hale enough to suggest to the group's security chief, who happened to be a federal informant, unfortunately for him, that he murdered the judge. And this ended up leading to him being convicted on account of solicitation of murder, three counts of obstruction of justice. He ended up getting a 40-year uh, federal prison sentence. And again, the church was on the verge of collapse. I would note that a year after this ruling, uh, Judge Lefkow's husband and mother were murdered after a break-in. And I have to say that many creativity adherents had been calling for Judge Lefkow to be murdered and gave out her address. Um, and one of them is someone who I'm going to be focusing on in this presentation by the name of Craig Cobb. Um, it appears that the people who killed uh, Lef Judge Lefkow's mother and uh, husband were not creativity adherents, but nevertheless this is a chilling uh, reminder of how violent these people can be and how serious they are about 
um, wanting to inflict violence on Jews and blacks and other minorities. Um, let me now talk about the other part of this that's, that's central to what's going on in the heartland, which is the rise of the National Socialist Movement. It's one of the largest and most prominent neo-Nazi groups in the United States. The Southern Poverty Law Center uh, reports that it has 61 chapters in 35 states. Uh, it's notable for its uh, violent uh, anti-Jewish rhetoric, uh, its racist views, its provocative uh, protests, which I'll talk about one uh, in Toledo in a moment, uh, and its policy allowing members of other racist groups to join the NSM while remaining members of other groups. That's what's really scary, is that the NSM kind of represents uh, a group attempt to consolidate the neo-Nazi movement in the United States, because there has been a fair amount of fragmentation. The Pioneer Little Europe movement represents a geographical attempt at consolidation. And it, as I conclude my talk, I'm going to say at the end that my, my concern is that this consolidation could lead to a greater power, uh, and uh, it's something that, that we have to be concerned about. But um, I would say that um, it was largely overshadowed in its early years. It was founded in 1974. You had groups like the National Alliance and the Aryan Nations. These were the big neo-Nazi groups in the United States. And the National Socialist Movement, or what it was called back then, uh, was, was somewhat small. Uh, but those other groups imploded in, the, in, in recent years. And the NSM started to take over. And let me just give you a little bit of background to help you understand how the NSM has been able to thrive. Its roots actually go back to the original American Nazi Party. So if we look at the NSM today, we can go all the way back to the beginning of the American Nazi Party movement, founded by former Navy Commander George Lincoln Rockwell, uh, who we see in the top photograph in the middle there. Uh, another infamous neo-Nazi who met an untimely demise, Rockwell was murdered by one of his own followers in 1967. And two of his chief lieutenants, Robert Brannan and Cliff Harrington, uh, formed the National Socialist American Workers' Freedom Movement in St. Paul, Minnesota. And if you look at your geography, uh, Minnesota is right next to North Dakota. And that's, again, why this strikes so close to home for us. The key event, though, and what really has caused the National Socialist Movement to take off is that leadership was passed on to Jeff Scoop in 1994, and he renamed it the National Socialist Movement. We see Scoop in the bottom photo there. And what really started to help the NSM take off is that Scoop was young, and he wanted, he realized that the old American Nazi Party movement was getting old and that it could die out. So he wanted to recruit young, new membership. And, uh, you know, with the demise of, of uh, the, not, the National Alliance's William Pierce, in 2002, Aryan Nation's Richard Butler in 2004. Scoop was only 21 years old, and he starts to set up a unit specifically focused on recruiting <coughs> teens, and he calls it the Viking Youth Corps. Um, kind of sounds like one of those old Waffen SS units. And then uh, he also launches a women's division. He wants to get women more involved. Uh, we see a photo of his wife uh, or girlfriend uh, trying to make it look fashionable to be a Nazi. Uh, and further trying to attract youth with an online presence. They set up a, a website with a newsletter, uh, downloadable leaflets, uh, field reports from NSM, NSM chapters around the country, and then they even create their own hate rock music label called NSM 88 Records, the 88 <coughs> being the number of letters, uh, eight of course being the eighth letter in the alphabet, HH uh, for Heil Hitler. <coughs> And in April 2007, they purchased the now popular white supremacist social networking site, New Saxon. So they're really trying to, 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 to recruit youth and get more uh, technologically savvy. Although their ideology is the same old uh, ideology that we've seen uh, since the time of Hitler, um, and, and, and therefore reflects the American Nazi Party ideology. They openly idolize Adolf Hitler. Uh, they describe him in their propaganda as our Fuhrer the beloved holy father of our age, a visionary in every respect. And they call for a greater America that would deny citizenship to Jews, non-whites, and homosexuals. This is their view of uh, America as the Fourth Reich. And they have, of course, they were founded in the heartland, and they focused a lot of their efforts in the heartland. Um, and uh, in the Midwest, uh, they have gone uh, to various towns 
They tried to create disturbances. Most prominently, they made international headlines after a planned march through a black neighborhood in Toledo, Ohio, which sparked rioting that cost the city more than $336,000. I would note that in connection with that, African Americans who complained about Scoop being there, he called them animals and other terrible things, tried to dehumanize them for complaining about these neo-Nazis coming into their neighborhood and terrorizing them. Minnesota, again, which is where the, this movement was founded and which is right next door to where I live, uh, has been the scene of some terrible NSM rallies, including book burnings, which were meant to glorify one of the Third Reich's favorite activities. Um, and you can see here, I've got some images from some of these book burnings. You can see um, any books related to Judaism. You can see kind of in the left corner there a book on Judaism that's being burnt. Uh, here we have a book on Israel. It's kind of hard to see in this light, but that middle where those, those bright flames are um, is a book. You can kind of see Israel above that if you, if you look closely. Um, it's it's extremely, uh, you know, violently anti-Jewish. And then, of course, as I say, they start to get the idea that they geographically can consolidate their power base by forming these communities through the Pioneer Little Europe movement. This was an idea that was first proposed in 2001 in a pamphlet by H. Michael Barrett that was titled Pioneer Little Europe Prospectus, which envisioned consolidating white residents in existing cities and towns and actively repelling racial minorities, Jews. It's been based primarily in Montana, where its leader, April Gade, has implored fellow white supremacists to move to Montana and form Pioneer Little Movement, uh, rather Pioneer Little Europe movements or communities there. Um, and one of the neo-Nazis in the United States who apparently was attracted to this was a guy named Craig Cobb, who I alluded to before. So what is the connection between Craig Cobb, the Pioneer Little Move, uh, Europe, sorry, the Pioneer Little Europe movement, the National Socialist movement, and creativity? Um, that's what we're about to explore. And it begins with an unusual bit of activity in the town of Leith, North Dakota. In 2012, someone started buying properties in Leith, uh, which at the time was, it's, you see different numbers, population 19, population 16, I've seen it as high more recently as 24. Uh, but these properties were being bought sight unseen, um, and the person ended up buying uh, more than a dozen lots for a few hundred dollars each, right, these are very cheap, mostly from landowners who lived elsewhere in the country, these were like absentee landlords. Um, and, of course, this person turned out to be Craig Paul Cobb, age 61, um, who moved into one of the properties himself, uh, one that he purchased for 5000 so one of the uh, more upscale properties. Um, but this was a ramshackle two-story house without running water. And then he announced on a white supremacist online forum that he intended to build an all-white, non-Jewish enclave of racists in North Dakota. The Southern Poverty Law Center got wind of this and started to spread the word, and so it became uh, a national, if you will, cause celeb. It's actually been covered in the international press. I recently read a story on this in the BBC. But the, his avowed purpose was to create a pioneer little Europe in Leith. And again, I think it's important to realize that places like Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, North Dakota, <coughs> these are considered appealing places for these, this movement because of a pretty homogenous population. There's less racial diversity, uh, higher percentage of, of Caucasians live in these, in these states. And he figured that he could bring enough people into this area. Uh, people probably think North Dakota is largely deserted. What there is, are, there, there's, there's, there are white people. We can create a, an enclave here. And what he wanted to, to make, if you will, the capital of this, uh, his, uh, his town, which he would convert lead North Dakota into Cobbsville. We can see a couple of his followers in front of his house with a Confederate flag. Let me give you a little bit of background on Cobb. He's a fascinating figure. Um, uh, he was reportedly born in 1951 to a well-to-do family. I, the BBC report that I read recently said that his father was a millionaire. Uh, he was an architect and land developer, supposedly, and his mother was an elementary school teacher. So he had this, what would seem to be a normal upbringing. I don't think there's any uh, history of his parents or his family being uh, involved with Nazi movements or racist movements. He went to a, a private boarding school in Boston where he graduated in 1968 
And somewhere along the way, um, he formed a favorable impression of the American Nazi leader, George Lincoln Rockwell, and former Third Reich Deputy Fuhrer Rudolf Hess, and he began to embrace uh, Nazi ideology, white supremacist ideology. Uh, supposedly, he served in the armed forces, for some reason moved to Edmonton, Canada for a few years, and then relocated to Hawaii, where he lived and worked as a taxi driver. He claims to have had Barack Obama as one of his fares, and he claims that the president told him that he was not born in the United States. I think you have to take that with a big grain of salt. In 2003, he allegedly pulled up stakes and moved to Frost, West Virginia, where he reportedly opened a grocery store and subsequently registered a business called Gray Store Aryan Autographs and 14 Words LLC. And during this time, he was also allegedly involved in interstate deliveries of a neo-Nazi newspaper published by Alex Linder, another one of the uh, prominent neo-Nazis in the country uh, who operates a white power online anti-Semitic forum called the Vanguard News Network, or VNA. He also copped it, supposedly distributed Project Schoolyard CDs to local children, which is essentially hate music that he was distributing to middle and high school kids. For some reason, he decides that he, he gets the idea that an ideal place to start a, an all-white supremacist enclave would be in Estonia. So he moves to Tallinn, Estonia in 2005, and he sets up a video sharing service for white supremacists called Pod Blanc that allows him to record himself issuing racist rants. And I, actually, this right here is one of those. This is what it looks like when he's, when he's issuing his racist rants on Pod Blanc. What he wanted to do was form alliances with skinheads uh, in, the, uh, in the area, uh, and he purchased land 30 miles south of the capital, and again, he wants to form an international office of white diaspora. This is sort of the more international version of the pioneer of Europe that he's trying to do in, in the United States. The difference is, and I'm going to talk about this when I talk about the fact that the United States really can't do a lot about it, in Estonia, they have laws that will prevent this sort of thing from happening, and they deport Cobb to Canada uh, in connection with his racist speech and activities in Estonia. So he moves to Vancouver. So reportedly, he continues his online racist and anti-Semitic activities, and the Canadians are able to charge him with willful promotion of hatred for his internet endeavors, but he flees Canada before he can be brought to trial. Now, let me give you a little bit of background about the Canadians, because I think it's relevant to what I want to propose later on, which is that the Canadians have laws that can allow for prosecution of people who are promoting uh, hatred against an identifiable or protected group, or for uh, incitement against those groups. Uh, the landmark case of Regina versus Keekstra from 1990 found the Canadian Supreme Court upholding Section 319 of the Canadian Criminal Code, which allows these prosecutions, finding that it was constitutional uh, under the freedom of expression provision in Section 2B of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. I would also note that Section 113 of the Canadian Human Rights Act prohibits the communication of messages that likely expose a person to hatred or contempt based on race, national, ethnic origin, color, religion, age, sex, sexual orientation, and, all these protected categories and provides for injunctions and money damages. <coughs> I have to tell you though that the Canadians voted last year to repeal this statute and it will no longer be in effect after June 2014. So you have somewhat of an interesting situation that the Canadians can apply their criminal laws to people who engage in this kind of speech activity but not civil laws. Um, but that's the way it is in Canada right now. Should we move towards something like that in the US? We'll talk about that. So let's go back to Cobb. He, he flees uh, the Canadians uh, because he doesn't want to get uh, prosecuted. He supposedly <coughs> returns to Montana's Flathead Valley, which is where April Gate is located. And she's the one who's promoting the Pioneer Little Europe movement. She's one of the founders. And so Cobb sort of gets that idea in his head, right? It was somewhat similar to what he wanted to do in Estonia. And he also realizes that in neighboring North Dakota, there is this booming oil and gas business that is going on. You all may have heard of the oil patch in North Dakota and the Bakken. There is a lot of money being made. Um, it's good for my state. It tends to assure that I get a raise every year, and I have tremendous job security. 
nothing like having tenure at the University of North Dakota these days. Uh, but unfortunately, it's attracting people um, that aren't quite as savory, and Cobb was among them. He reportedly began working on a road construction crew, uh, which he also supposedly was terminated from. But he started to believe, well, you know what, maybe I don't need that job, because he found Leap North Dakota, he had a little money, and obviously for a few hundred dollars per lot, he could start buying up uh, the, the parcels in Leap that I talked about earlier. And that's, that kind of brings us full circle to what he started to do. What is Leith? Leith is a town in Grant County, North Dakota. Um, I'll go back to where it was on the map in North Dakota. You can see where that A is, that red A. Um, that's, it's sort of in the western part of the state, close to where the oil patch is. And so um, it's got 16, 19, 24. The estimates vary. Not many people. Interestingly, there is an African-American living in the town uh, who lives right across an alleyway from Cobb. Um, he's the only black resident in the town, and he's married to a white woman. Um, he has tried to be tolerant, but uh, Cobb has made it clear that he doesn't want people like Bobby Harper around there. I would also point out that North Dakota, uh, while not in any way resembling New York City, still has a very nice Jewish community and a decent sized one in Bismarck, which is pretty close to Leith. And so these activities uh, have been alarming to the Jewish community, and, and since I'm here in this gap today, uh, I think it's worth pointing out. So this, this guy is, is sort of a terror in western North Dakota. And what really is scary is that what he's trying to do is he's trying to bring in all of the, if you will, the illuminaries of the neo-Nazi movement in the United States to Leith, North Dakota. So Tom Metzger, who many of you uh, would have heard of, who is the former Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan and now leads a group known as White Area Resistance or War, he purchased a lot for one dollar from Cobb in June 2012. Four months later, Alex Linder, who I mentioned earlier, who runs the VNN, he did the same thing. Um, Cobb donated buildings in lead to the National Socialist Movement, as, as we know, which was run by Jeff Scoop. And according to an August post um, on the hate site Stormfront, April Gade and her husband Mark, Mark Harrington also own property in North Dakota. So he's trying to consolidate the neo-Nazi movement in the United States in Leaf, North Dakota. I, I, I point out as an aside here that he reportedly also said he wanted to transfer property to the Greek ultra-nationalist political party Golden Dawn, as well as former Klansman and Louisiana State Representative David Duke. So he wants everybody uh, in, in, in the Nazi movement uh, to, to, to come to Leaf, North Dakota. And it, it, it looks like he's succeeding. He's been posting on white, the White Nations Forum, uh, continuing to try to lure other white supremacists to come to lead. He's posted about the great economic situation in North Dakota, the availability of jobs given the oil and gas boom, um, and how Dickinson, uh, which is really where a lot of the hub of that activity is, is very close to Lee, and it's also close to Bismarck. And he's posted pictures of his plans for the town, including put it, putting up a photo showing the site where he intends to create the Dr. William L. Pierce Private Park of Leith, uh, who is right, the, the former leader of the neo-Nazi uh, National Alliance I talked about a little bit earlier. Um, so this is his idea for Leith. Well, finally, in September, people had had enough. And uh, on September 22nd, about 400 people converged on Leith to protest Cobb's plans. Uh, the rally was planned by a group called United N or U Unite ND, which was created by a group called Anti-Racist Action, or ARA. This point came up yesterday in the Q&A in Columbia. A lot of Native Americans were involved in this protest, and of course they're affected by this too. Um, I, should, I should note that. It's not a coincidence that they picked September 22nd, because this was scheduled to coincide with a visit from Jeff Scoop, uh, as we know, head of the NSM, to support COPS plans. Scoop showed up with about a dozen NSM members wearing Nazi regalia, um, and they planted Nazi flags throughout the city, and they had a march through the town. And Scoop sent a letter to the mayor of Leith, Ryan Schock, before the visit, warning residents against standing up to the NSM and cops' plants, if you will, in my opinion, trying to intimidate everybody. Uh, and I quote him, Craig Cobb will not be ousted from the community. Craig is not breaking any laws or ordinances. He has a right to reside in Leith just as any other American does. 
We are not asking you or any other residents of LEAF to change whatever political stance you may or may not have. If anything, you should see this for what it is, a chance of revitalizing a community and a chance to be neighborly to your new neighbors and vice versa. So this is an interesting spin on what Cobb wants to do, but it's also a fascinating point, which is he may be right legally, as far as we can tell, I'm going to look at this in a little bit, on the surface, there's nothing wrong with what Cobb's doing. He's not breaking any laws. And yet, the, the town was feeling paralyzed and, and really not knowing what to do. However, it started to, the town started to fight back. It set up a website. Uh, it wanted to spread the word. First of all, it wanted to let the world know, we don't endorse this. We don't support this. We have no idea why this misfortune was visited on us. <laughs> But they, they, they started this LeafND.com, and they said in the coming days, weeks, and months, we the citizens will endeavor to present a more realistic point of view as to our moral fiber and ties to the community. Um, and it sought do donations to deal with lawsuits that Cobb was threatening. And I'll tell you a little bit about the nature of those lawsuits in a moment, but it claimed that civil rights were being violated. There were also other local efforts. Um, county health officials condemned Cobb's ramshackle house because it had no running water, um, and money was, was raised uh, consistent with the uh, website. They set up a fund uh, to, to have money in case the cob were to sue, and there was actually even discussion of dissolving the town of Leith so it could be incorporated into the county. So if Cobb tried to take over the city government, he wouldn't be able to do that. It would be the county that would be in control. So there are all these sort of you know, desperate measures that the town was trying to think of what it could do creatively to deal with this problem. And ultimately, they passed ordinances to deal with Cobb. I love this image of Cobb coming to one of the city council meetings and yelling at them. Uh, and they're telling him, hey, get out of here. Um, you know, he's, he's spewing racial epithets at them and you know, calling them Jews and controlled by Jews, etc. cetera. Um, and yet, they, they said, look, we don't care. We're going to pass some ordinances to deal with you. And they actually, one of them, approved a moratorium on any new construction in the town because these neo-Nazis were planning to build on the lots that Cobb had sold them. And another ordinance uh, prevented tents and cappers from being set up on a city lot for more than 10 consecutive days, right? Because what was going to happen is these neo-Nazis were going to come in with tents and campers. They were going to build houses. And you know this was part of the plan. So this was a, a way to try to thwart that. Cobb, and you know maybe he had a point, called these ordinances patently unfair. <coughs> Um, and said residents of the town were evil and nasty. Uh, why now, he asked, is it a wonderful coincidence that the moment I show up, these measures are necessary? And so, I mean, obviously these seem to be desperate measures. Um, are they really effective measures? I think we need to ask ourselves that. The town was trying to do whatever it could within the law to deal with this, this scourge. And then I have to point out, things started to go downhill for Cobb. And the beginning of his problems uh, was when he agreed to be on a TV show in the UK, uh, The Trisha Show, which was hosted by a black British TV personality by the name of Trisha Goddard. And as part of the show, he submitted to a DNA test, which revealed that he was 14% sub-Saharan sub African heritage. On TV, this was revealed, and it's great. <laughs> Trisha came over and tried to give him a fist pump. He was not happy. You kind of see that there. And he was humiliated. Even... You know, within the neo-Nazi movement, when he came back to the United States, and people in Leith started to taunt him. So this was, he, he, was, he was really upset. So he made a mistake. He went out with one of his followers, a guy uh, named uh, Keenan Dutton, another neo-Nazi, and they went around with rifles, shotguns, um, and they terrorized the residents of Leith because they were so <coughs> angry that they were suggesting that Cobb had uh, African blood in him. Uh, and they were threatening them, uh, you know, racial epithets, anti-Semitic epithets. Uh, he claimed that he was reacting to threats from his fellow elite citizens, but they weren't going around with guns. Uh, and he, he went too far and he was arrested uh, for uh, terrorizing these residents. His bail was set at a million dollars. He has not been able to post a bond for that amount, so he's currently awaiting uh, trial and custody. Uh, the bond amount was reduced, but he still wasn't able to post. In January, uh, just last month, Dutton pled guilty to a series of misdemeanors in exchange for testifying against the Cobb trial, and he's been released on probation. So Cobb's kind of 
on his own now, if you will, with respect to this criminal case. Let me point out, however, that Cobb has tried to strike back. He sued the North Dakota Attorney General. Um, he filed a complaint against Wayne Stengem, our Attorney General, alleging discrimination against his creativity religion after the AG told the radio station, quote, white supremacist Craig Cobb and his supporters are not the kind of people wanted in North Dakota. So he has sued. So that brings us, that segues nicely into the legal issues that I think are raised by all this that I want to talk about now for the remainder of my chat, which is, let's assume Cobb hadn't been arrested for terrorizing the Leith residents with his firearm. What else could have been done to stop him from taking over this town uh, with this little pioneer Europe movement? I mean, he could have very well not gone out with his firearm and, you know, he would, his momentum would not have been stopped at all. And so I think we could ask ourselves, and he still might, we don't know, he still could get acquitted. We don't know, even if he's uh, convicted, we don't know if he could get overturned on appeal. We don't know what's going to happen. What if he ultimately succeeds in taking control over the town, governance, um, or uh, other towns uh, with his fellow neo-Nazis? <coughs> Is there anything that can be done to protect uh, the minorities uh, who would be affected by this? And if current law cannot protect minorities, and if it cannot stop neo-Nazis from taking over towns like this, um, should the law be changed? And I want to talk about that a little bit. So I think there are some legal issues that we can consider um, pre-takeover. In other words, you know, cop says, I'm going to take over this town. You know, there's nothing you can do to stop me. Let's consider whether that's true. And I think we, we should look at the housing laws, the civil rights laws, uh, also the issue of freedom of expression and free exercise of religion, because as we've seen, of course, he claims that creativity is a religion and he's being discriminated against. Let's start with housing laws. Um, it turns out that last month, the city attorney declared the cop's house could not be condemned, right, because they had originally condemned it, uh, despite the fact that there's no sewage or, or running water, but it has been declared un uninhabitable. So that's, again, that's sort of a half measure that, that doesn't, doesn't help a lot. Um, the building, I will say, though, the building moratorium and the tent trailer ordinance appear to stand up. But, you know, how, how effective is that? If these people had been wealthy enough to buy homes in Leith in the first place, then they wouldn't be stopped. Uh, you know, he could buy up all the properties he wanted, and he could take over town government. So these seem like half measures. These seem like desperate efforts to find a creative way in the law to stop it by <coughs> other people uh, better healed neo-Nazis would certainly not face such obstacles. So the housing laws don't seem that promising. What about civil rights laws? Well, I, I mean, you know, we can talk about this. My research seems to reveal that, that there are no laws to prevent a neo-Nazi or other hate group from buying up properties, threatening to exclude Jews, blacks, or other minorities, and taking over municipal governance. I'm not aware of any laws in the United States that would prevent that. So he seems to be free to go ahead and do that. A more interesting area is freedom of expression and the doctrine of fighting words. And I want to spend a little bit more time on that. We are all familiar probably with the First Amendment uh, of the Constitution, which declares that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. One of our most sacred and important constitutional protections. Let me point out, however, that with respect to freedom of speech, there have been decisions that have found that it is not unlimited. Even though the United States is the most speech-protective country in the world, there is the case of Chaplinsky, Chaplinsky versus New Hampshire from 1942. And in that case, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that fighting words are not accorded First Amendment protection. And fighting words were defined to include words which are likely to incite an immediate fight and words which inflict injury. And then we get a little bit of fleshing out of that doctrine in Beauharnais versus Illinois from 1952, where the Supreme Court upheld an Illinois law making it illegal to publish or exhibit any writing or picture portraying the depravity, criminality, unchastity, or lack of virtue of a class of citizens of any race, color, creed, or religion. So this seems like perhaps a promising doctrine, except unfortunately, it gets uh, watered down, if not completely neutered, by the case of Terman Yellow versus Chicago uh, from 1949. I realize that 
Beauharnais is from 1952, and this is from 1949. What ends up happening is Terman Yellow uh, gets the better of the two decisions. In that case, the court held that to constitute fighting words, it was no longer enough that the speaker's words made the listeners angry. Rather, incitement to violence was now required. Um, Terman Yellow, uh, in that case, viciously criticized certain political and religious groups, and the crowd, which was upset by his comments, could not be controlled by the police. So the police arrested Terman Yellow for breach of the peace, but the Supreme Court ultimately overturned his conviction and held, and I quote, the vitality of civil and political institutions in our society depends on free discussion. Free speech is supposed to incite dispute, and it is often provocative and challenging while it presses for acceptance. The most valuable expression may well be that which, because it is provocative and challenging, produces these emotions. Therefore, a state may not punish a person for arousing a crowd to act violently simply by initiating a public dispute. And we can see that this is something that we would call the heckler's veto. In other words, when members of the audience gain the right to silence any speaker with whom they disagree. And Terman Yellow essentially rejects the idea that the heckler's veto can work. Now, what Terman Yellow tells us is that it's not going to be enough simply to uh, define fighting words the way Chaplinsky did. It's going to have to mean that there is incitement to violence. The standard for incitement to violence was laid out by the US, by the US Supreme Court in Brandenburg versus Ohio from 1969, where the court held that uh, speech uh, that incites to violence could be prosecuted criminally if it was intended to incite to imminent lawless violence and was reasonably likely to incite to imminent lawless violence, which is a very high standard. Okay? So Sherman Yellow means that it's going to be very difficult for someone who gets up and makes horrific statements about minorities, Jews, blacks, Hispanics, uh, for there to be any kind of legal action taken against them. There is, however, um, and, and let me let me explain how that played out in Skokie. You probably all have heard of the infamous Skokie march of the Nazis in Skokie, Illinois. Uh, and in the case of Skokie versus National Socialist Party uh, in 1978, in the Illinois case, it was held, uh, it was found to be an especially strong state case, uh, but it disallowed the fighting words rationale, even in circumstances of extreme provocation uh, and targeted insult, in spite of Chaplinsky. And in that case, uh, a Nazi group planned to demonstrate in Skokie, which was a predominantly Jewish community, and about 5,000 of its residents were actually survivors of concentration camps. And just before the scheduled demonstration, the village enacted several ordinances designed to neutralize the demonstration, including one forbidding the dissemination of any materials which promote or incite racial or religious hatred. However, the court held that there was simply no principled way of distinguishing between this situation and speech that stirs listeners to unrest, um, uh, uh, which is exactly the kind of speech that was protected in Terman Yellow. So essentially, Terman Yellow acted as a shield to protect the Nazis when they wanted to pr protest in Skokie. And I think we have to wonder whether it's right that people who are carrying the swastika, uh, who are uh, bringing up Adolf Hitler and the memory of the Holocaust, can go into a place where survivors of the worst horrors of the Holocaust have come to the United States seeking haven and essentially terrorize them uh, with this, this protest. But that's essentially what the free speech jurisprudence says right now. Now, there is, I'd say, a glimmer of hope. And that is something that we see in Virginia versus Black in 2003, a more recent case. The issue there presented was, does the Commonwealth of Virginia's cross-burning statute, which prohibits the burning of a cross with the intent of intimidating any person or group of persons violate the First Amendment. And the court held yes. However, in a plurality opinion <coughs> delivered by Justice O'Connor, the court held that while a state consistent with the First Amendment may ban cross burning carried out with the intent to intimidate, the provision in this particular case of the Virginia statute treating any cross burning as prima facie evidence of intent to intimidate renders the statute unconstitutional in its current form. The reason why I say there's a glimmer of hope here is that this plurality opinion pointed out that speech activity that seems to be carried out with intent to intimidate can be prosecuted. And so I would suggest to you 
that that could be the opening that is needed to kind of bring us back to the roots of Chaplinsky uh, and perhaps uh, lower the standard that we find in Brandenburg versus Ohio. So let me get to the last issue before I get to that, which is uh, related to the free exercise of religion, right? We just looked at the, the text of the First Amendment and we saw that it protects the free exercise of religion. And the reason why this is relevant is that, as I mentioned earlier, Cobb has tried to use his religion, the so-called creativity religion, as a sword to deal with people who are trying to stop him from carrying out his plans. By essentially saying, hey look, you know, you are violating my civil rights because I'm trying to practice my religion, which happens to be uh, white supremacy and hatred of, of minorities, um, but it's a religion and you can't do that to me. And there are two cases that deal with this issue of whether creativity is a religion. Um, and there's a split. In Peterson versus Wilmer Communications from the Eastern District of Wisconsin in 2002, a U.S. District Court found that the creativity religion constitutes a religion for purposes of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And in that case, you had a, uh, uh, a person who, a, a neo-Nazi, who was saying that he was practicing the creativity religion, and that he was discriminated against in his job. He was uh, denied benefits or terminated in his job, and he claimed that that was because of his exercise of religion. And the court in that case found that, yes, this is a religion. However, in Connor versus Tilton, 2009 case from the Northern District of California, uh, a district court found that creativity did not qualify as a religion for First Amendment purposes. So the first case is decided under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The second case is decided under the First Amendment. However, the first case is published, the second case isn't. And so in terms of published cases, which have, of course, more uh, authority and teeth, uh, it would seem that uh, creativity is considered to be a religion uh, according to the case law. Um, and so therefore, um, it would seem that neo-Nazis can use creativity uh, as a sword for pursuing litigation against government officials who make statements or take actions against their initiatives. And I, I give you, as a case in point, the lawsuit that Cobb has filed against the North Dakota Attorney General Wayne Stenger. All right, so these are all the issues that I think come up in terms of what can we do or what are we dealing with before a cop actually takes over the town? What about after he takes over the town? Well, here is where I think um, the, the law can start to do something. Um, Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, the, the classifications that we looked at before, um, uh, in programs and activities, activities receiving federal financial assistance. So assuming the cop were to take over the government and transform the policies of LEAF, if you can show any money in any indirect way going to LEAF, you can make the connection to Title VI, and therefore uh, you, can, you can have a lawsuit because Cobb will be running afoul of Title VI. Regardless of whether Cobb assumes any governmental function, functions, um, which by the way would also implicate uh, equal protection and due process clause issues, um, where I think he could be uh, sued, as well as Title VI. Um, let's say he discriminates uh, against people that he chooses to rent to or sell properties to. He would also run afoul of Title VIII of the 1968 Civil Rights Act, which is known as the Fair Housing Act, which renders it unlawful to discriminate in the sale or rental of housing because of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. So on the federal level, post-takeover, definitely seems that there are remedies. Even on a state level, uh, and I'm, I'm proud to say that North Dakota um, has these laws, although um, they don't apply to sexual orientation, and I, I want to say publicly that I'm ashamed of that. Uh, we ought to have uh, protection for our LGBT uh, fellow citizens. But with respect to these other classifications, if Cobb refused to sell or rent because of race, color, religion, sex, disability, age, familial status, or national origin, he would violate the North Dakota Housing Discrimination Act. And the North Dakota Human Rights Act forbids adverse discrimination uh, in the provision of public accommodation or services based on the categories I just mentioned, minus sexual orientation. Again, hopefully we'll get that law fixed. So the problem is, 
from when we look at the laws, it, it seems that there's nothing that we can do um, during the takeover itself. Um, and you know, if Cobb is just buying properties, bringing in his fellow neo-Nazis, taking over lo local government, terrified residents can't really do anything. They have to wait for Cobb's policies to be implement, implemented, and then they're going to have to file uh, lawsuits or initiate litigation. And we know that that takes time. We know how, how long it takes for things to work themselves through the court system. So in the meantime, you've got an area that is <coughs> dominated by neo-Nazis raising uh, the Nazi flag, uh, renaming uh, places after Adolf Hitler and, and, and Rockwell and, and, and all this. Uh, and, and people in the area uh, can do nothing about it. Uh, and in the meantime, if they, if they try to speak out against it, Cobb could presumably file a lawsuit, a civil rights lawsuit, claiming that he's being discriminated against on the grounds of his religion. So I don't think that this is a good situation. I, I, I am not comfortable with this, and I think that something needs to change. So um, this is what, what I propose. Let's amend the laws. Perhaps we can enact a civil rights law that aims to prevent something like this neo-Nazi takeover. If such groups have an avowed purpose to take over a town and thereby deprive citizens of their civil rights, um, I submit to you that the law should permit preventive action uh, in the form of injunctions. Why should we sit around and wait and not be able to do anything while this terrible activity is taking place and terrorizing uh, people in the area? And then in accord with what I submit is the emerging doctrine from the black case, um, I think Termin Yellow should be overruled, and I think that the holding in Beauharnais and Chaplinsky should be reinstituted, and that we should have actually a fighting words doctrine that has teeth. By the same token, I also think we should water down the standard for incitement that we see in Brandenburg versus Ohio. The other thing that I think we should be looking seriously at is whether or not we want to find that creativity is truly a religion. Uh, I think that that is a bunch of bunkum. Um, and there is a test which determines whether or not uh, a, a movement is, quote unquote, a religion. And the prongs, there are three that we look at. Does it address fundamental and ultimate questions having to do with deep and imponderable matters? <laughs> I, I just don't think saying that the white race is supreme and that anything that's good for the white race is, is a religion, to me, that, that's, that's not fundamental and ultimate questions having to do with deep and imponderable matters. Um, uh, secondly, um, it's not going to be a religion if it's, if it's not comprehensive in nature um, and generally confined to one question or one moral teaching without laying claim to an ultimate and comprehensive truth. Again, I think the narrow claim that the white race is superior to any other race uh, is just the kind of uh, narrow question that is being dealt with in this movement, that means it shouldn't qualify as a religion. And then finally, um, it does not include formal characteristics analogous to those of traditional religions. I think that one's going to be a little more difficult. Um, there are some trappings of religion, uh, including, as we saw, that big W with the look like a crown, which sort of shows that the white race is superior. Um, but I, I don't think that that's akin to the kind of symbol, the symbols and the, the uh, places of worship and things like that that we see in what we would really call a religion. So I think if we um, either change the law more explicitly or uh, initiate more litigation in the courts, we should be able to find uh, that this is not a religion and therefore can't be used um, as a sword by the neo-Nazis. So why do I think all this matters? Well, let's assume again that Cobb is acquitted um, or that he serves his, his, his sentence. Um, he has set his sights on taking over other towns in North Dakota. He has said that uh, he's even looked at a town called Regan, which is in Burley County, that has a population of 43, and said, you know what, if it doesn't work out in Leith, I'll try there, or I'll try other places. Other neo-Nazis have been inspired by the Little Pioneer Movement. Uh, for example, um, white supremacist Richard Bunk has allegedly been buying up properties in the tiny town of Rachel, Nevada, which is at the doorstep of the infamous Area 51, uh, perhaps not coincidentally, uh, with a view of taking over town governance there. And neo-Nazi Paul Mullet announced on the Area Nations website that he was seeking donations to come up with a 5,000 deposit 
dollar deposit needed to buy 15 acres of land in southern Tennessee to serve as a new area of Republic homeland. What, what my point is that little cells like this can multiply if we're not vigilant. The other thing that can happen is that these enclaves can gather and concentrate all of the major neo-Nazi groups together into one area, and that makes them more powerful. Right now, they're more splintered. And I think what's scary about the National Socialist Movement and the Little Pioneer Europe Movement is that they seek to consolidate both the groups and the geography of these neo-Nazi groups, potentially making them more uh, powerful. And my, my concern is that while they may be somewhat hiding in the shadows now, if we have a major economic downturn or some other national or international calamity, they will have a solid base from which to recruit. They will have a good infrastructure. And God forbid we see a fourth right, uh, uh, even if, if they, they make strides, significant strides in doing that in the United States. That is a prospect that I think we all would think would be horrific. And so I think we need to take this seriously. I think we need to consider changing the laws. Um, and I would now open it up for your questions and thank you for your attention. Yes. Is, uh, <laughs> you, you did not, as far as I heard, um, consider Kilo as a possible uh, anodyne for this. Kilo being that the, the municipality, before he takes over, decidedly, would say for the public wheel, for the public good, we can absorb your home or your property or something because it's the greater good for the greater number of people, even though I hate Kilo normally. But Kilo for this application seems to be one uh, possible route to stop his growth. If you could say this is for the greater good, too bad for you, that will discourage all the outliers as well, all his uh, colleagues in the Nazi uh, situation. Kilo, how do you spell that? K-E-L-O, 2002. That was um, farmhouses were taken over by people who did not want them to be taken over because the city said we have to run a train through here or we have to have a municipal facility here. And these people lost their homes right? because the law said they can't. Sort of like an eminent domain. Eminent domain, yeah. exactly. Right. Oh, that's interesting. Well, I appreciate you bringing that up. And I, that's something that I will add to the, uh, the potential uh, remedies that we can see here. Thank you. Yeah, yes. How many members of these organizations are there and where is the money coming from? It doesn't seem like they work. That's a, that's a very good question. I, I think the numbers aren't really known. Um, fortunately, I don't think we're talking about you know uh, tens of millions of people. I think we're, we're talking more in the thousands. Uh, are we talking uh, hundreds of thousands? Are we talking tens of thousands? I really don't have that, that information at my fingertips. Uh, however, um, I do think that um, they're growing. And what's scary is that the National Socialist Movement is very clever in terms of how it's going about its business by saying, look, you can belong to these other groups. We're an umbrella group. So don't give up your membership. Join us, and we can help consolidate our activities. You know, like I said, I'm not as worried about, you know, saying that there are, you know, millions of these people uh, right now in the country. Um, but if we have a problem, you know, what happened in, in, in Germany? Uh, there was the, the depression. Uh, you know, we've all seen the, the famous images of people uh, with a wheelbarrow full of marks to buy a loaf of bread. Um, and that's when groups like this uh, start to gain tremendous numbers. Uh, they, they start to have uh, the, the great membership that they're looking for. Uh, what they want right now is a base. And they wait for their time. They wait for their moment uh, when, when things go wrong. Uh, they're they're, they're kind of like, uh, you know, if I, I hate to use images and language that they use themselves to describe Jews, for example, but they are somewhat like a virus that is that lays dormant, and then when the body uh, is weak and resistance is low, they they, they attack, and, and that's that's my concern here. Yes, follow up. Where do they get their money from? Oh yes, um, I think that they do a lot of fundraising. Uh, generally through their websites. Um, now I think it's become mostly an online phenomenon. Um, uh, but they go around, you know, you saw for example, uh, Cobb was distributing uh, that hate music um, uh, to middle and high school kids. They try to get people when they're younger 
and these people, you know, they go out and they get jobs and, and they, they, they pay dues or, you know, they, they make contributions. Um, I'm not an expert on it, and I, I bet you the S SPLC, could, the Southern Poverty Law Center, could tell you what the funding sources are a lot more uh, effectively than I could. But my sense is it's from online. A lot, a lot of it is now online. Um, and what scares me, again, and I think this is another free speech issue, is that when they're online, they can get to so many people so rapidly, and they can initiate communication throughout the country, if not the world, right? Because the world is open for funding to them now with, with the internet. Um, and so uh, that, that's a great concern to me, the old notion of the marketplace of ideas. Um, if anybody wants to challenge me on the First Amendment grounds, um, why do we have a First Amendment protecting free speech? Well, I would argue it's because uh, it protects our democracy and it helps protect and promote self-actualization of our citizens. I'm personally not that worried about protecting uh, neo-Nazis and their self-actualization in their racist uh, uh, ideology. Uh, and so when we talk about what they're able to do online uh, and the marketplace of ideas, whether we can counter their uh, hate speech with good speech, um, I think the internet kind of changes the equation a little bit and makes me wonder whether we maybe should have a law like Canada, where Cobb was very active on the internet and with Pod Blanc, and the Canadians said, we're going to prosecute you, or Estonia, and a lot of these other countries in Europe that have these laws. I'm going to be exploring that in my, uh, in my book uh, that, that hopefully will be published in the next year. Um, but, but I think that this is an example of why we may want to think about changing the law. Yes? Sorry, uh, there are right now, uh, at the last count, 23 states that have <clears throat> stammy stands, men and women and children who are training for takeover of the United States who are Islamic. And I asked the FBI why they don't stop it. They said, oh, we keep an eye on it. We don't stop them. They, forgive me, seem more important to me, more powerful and more threatening, surreptitiously, than does this, because in every movie, and I pay a lot of attention to movies because it's the current ethos, as it is seen by millions around the world, movies still show the romance of Nazism, the swastikas and all the gear and the whole business, even though, for me, they are a past incident, and Islam and Muslims are much more a problem, but movies are terrified <coughs> of showing Muslims, so the Nazis get all this free ed, free uh, publicity, free hype, and nobody pays attention to the people who are currently taking over cities, because these Stanistans, are taking over cities quietly. The, the city and the police try to stop them and they beat them up or they throw stones at them or they do a variety of things to say, this is our property, we bought it, go to hell. And therefore, we should be paying more attention, forgive me, I know Nazism is not a good thing, but we should be paying attention to the surreptitious growth of outlying groups that are Islamic who are doing all this takeover business and assumption of city control and so forth. That's what it, it seems to me. That's much more a stealth problem, as far as I can see. Well, I think they're linked, aren't they? I mean, you know, what happened when, you know, the Nazis took over Germany? Um, they became natural allies. Yes. Uh, you know, you, you see the famous picture of Hitler with the Grand Mufti. Right. Uh, I, I see these folks as, as being allies. And, and I, I would think that, um, again, this is the, the problem is linked, that when, when you have a, a serious problem in this country, that's when these groups come together and they say, let's, you know, let, let's take care. It's all it's the Jews, you know. It's it's they're they're causing all the problems. Um, so I, I appreciate you bringing it up, and I think it's something we should be concerned about as well. Uh, I think what, whether it's whether it's neo Nazis or whether it's uh, it's extremist uh, Muslims uh, or Islamists, um, we're dealing with the same phenomenon, which is the ability of these groups to form a power base and what the law can do to deal with it. The point is that the law is deficient, and um, we, we need to be uh, more vigilant and, and, and do something about it. So your, your point is very well taken. Although, one, last, one quick last point on that. I think it's a little more problematic there if, if it, there you have to be more careful because if it seems as though you're targeting people on the basis of their religion, because no one's going to argue that Islam is a valid religion I would. Uh, under I any would. standard, I well, think I disagree with that. You and I are, are not going to agree there. Um, I'm being clever. 
But well, I still think it's not really not acceptable. As long as a, as a perfectly acceptable and valid religion, it is practiced by some in a way that is despicable and wrong. But uh, but we have to be careful. Uh, and, and in the name of Islam, some terrible things have been done. Of course, in the name of a lot of religions, some terrible things have been done. Uh, but we need to respect our Islamic citizens and let them exercise their religion the way they need to. But not uh, people who have an avowed purpose of uh, excluding Jews or committing violence against them, the thing that you're talking about. What I, the reason I say that we have to be concerned about that is because since it is a valid religion, they are going to have a much better argument that there's discrimination on the basis of religion. And I just say that I think we should be aware of that as well. Yes? Thank you, Nick. Um, I, I think um, this is a way of denying the Holocaust. Absolutely. This, this is, uh, after those many years, I think this is another example of denying the Holocaust. Like, uh, people are using other uh, ways to deny genocide from Rwanda, where I come from. And uh, I think it's also the responsibility of the state to include in laws uh, articles uh, defining, for example, what is religion? Religious, what, what that means for the government, for the state. Because if those guys are saying, oh, this is our religion, but for the state, what is religion? Then the Catholic, Protestants, uh, you know, like as religious, <coughs> what is the definition to accept that this is a religion. And I think this, this is the responsibility of, of, of the state to define this. Uh, I, 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 appreciate, I, I appreciate what you're saying, and I, and I do think that we need to, we need to understand. Because for me, when we look at this, at this test, uh, the three prongs that I have here at the bottom of the slide, um, I, I just don't think something like creativity comes anywhere close to satisfying that. And it's, it's, it's fascinating that a federal court found that it did for purposes of Title Seven of the Civil Rights Act, um, but 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 yeah, I think we I think we need to whether it's by legislation because this is this is through court decisions that we, we have these three prongs. Um, but what strikes me, especially what you're saying, uh, Jean Damasen, is that um, in Rwanda you have laws that criminalize the denial of the genocide against the Tutsis in Rwanda. Um, should we have a law that 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 criminalizes the denial of the Holocaust. There's been a lot of debate about that. I think Rwanda has a different situation because the genocide took place in Rwanda and there are still victims and families um, that were uh, directly affected by the genocide. It's only 20 years now uh, that, that the denial laws in a lot of ways make sense. Do they make sense in a place like the United States? We have a lot of uh, survivors. We have the situation in Skokie, for example. I think it raises a tougher question, but I'm just starting to re-examine some of these issues. Um, as you know, we're going to have a panel at the uh, International Association of Genocide Scholars uh, conference in Winnipeg in June on or July. July. Is it July? July. On denial, um, and I, I think I think we, we need to talk about whether we need to revise our laws in, in that sense. Um, I, I mentioned yesterday at my talk at Columbia. Uh, Jeremy Waldron's book, uh, Jeremy Waldron here at, at NYU, The Harm and Hate Speech. Um, and I think he makes some valid points about how citizens, like the residents in Skokie, uh, should not have to be subjected to this kind of verbal assault. And, you know, the idea that we have in this country that there's, there's kind of a libertarian idea that we have in the First Amendment that, you know, it's sort of a self help thing. You're being attacked verbally, well, then attack back, essentially, you know, argue against it. Um, I don't know that, that that's really the best model. We have, uh, you know, Waldron in his book talks about a product's liability. If a company releases poisonous products into the stream of commerce, it's going to have to deal with the consequences from a liability perspective. It's going to get sued. It might get prosecuted. Why isn't that true of hate speech as well? It raised some tough questions. I, I'm... I struggle with them because I do believe that freedom of expression is essential to a vibrant and healthy democracy, but should there be some protections? Maybe we've gone too far, maybe we are, you know, we are so strongly protective of speech in the United States that we allow some bad things to happen uh, in the name of freedom of speech 
and I'm starting to question whether we should. Yes. Is right. there um, is there much coordination or communication between these umbrella groups uh, that operate domestically and some kind of counterparts uh, in other countries, Eastern Europe or wherever? I know that you know, Russia and Ukraine, and Belarus have a lot of big, but they just seem like uh, I don't know if they're as organized. Um, they may have deeper pockets. That's a great point, and that obviously goes to the fundraising. When I was saying that I thought the internet is now the, the, the real engine for fundraising for groups like this, um, absolutely. If they're, you know, the skinheads in Estonia that Cobb was trying to link up with, um, you know, he, for example, serves as a natural connection between those folks who he knows uh, and the people in the United States. Um, I think with the internet, we have tremendous possibilities, unfortunately, for these groups to connect. What is the actual degree of their connection? Right now, I don't know that it's so um, tight. Um, but you know, you can imagine. Let's say they're able to put together one of these enclaves, um, and it's successful. It thrives, and that's used as an example of what could be done in other countries. And then the enclaves in those other countries start to coordinate more. more. Absolutely, you, it could, we live in the global village now. We can see that becoming more of an international phenomenon. But you know the United States is such a, it's the most powerful country in the world and often serves as an example for what other countries do. Um, we have to be concerned about it happening right here in, in this country. I, I do think it could lead to that, it really do. This may be too narrow a question, but I'm interested in the dynamic that draws people into the movement. For example, you mentioned Cobb having a black antecedents in part. And yes. of the boroughs, of course, was the infamous guy who was Jewish who became a Nazi. Right. What, what, is there any uh, point to that psychological dynamic? Such a great question. Um, uh, and of course, it, it, it largely exceeds the scope of my expertise in, in this talk. But I'll still venture, I'll venture some thoughts. Um, I, I think that people become disillusioned for various reasons, and they're looking for answers. And um, hatred can be a very powerful narcotic, and I think that they tend to use that narcotic as a way of dealing with the sense of anime, um, disillusionment, uh, lack of clarity in their lives, um, and, and that can it, it, it can affect anybody. Let's also, when we talk about hatred, let's not forget self-hate, um, and I believe that that's one of the topics that ISCAF, there's a talk that's coming up about um, Jews who are anti-Semitic, self-hating. Um, I look at somebody like Bobby Fischer, the great chess champion, who was one of the most notorious anti-Semites. He, he hated himself. And, and so he was able to channel that hatred for himself into anti-Semitism. Um, someone sent me an email before I came here and said, I'm going to come to your talk. I still don't know if that person has been either here or today. Maybe you will reveal yourself or was here yesterday. Um, and said, I want to ask you about why the Jews, why anti-Semitism? Why is it that the Jews are always the focus of this, of this hatred? I want to talk about that. And in my email, I said, well, that's a big question. I don't know that we'll come up with any answers at my talk, but I think it's related. And we were talking about this last night with uh, Professor Meekman, who gave a talk with me yesterday at Columbia. Um, I think that there's always going to be uh, a locus for hatred to concentrate itself. It's always going to find its pockets. It's always going to find its, its areas where it can, uh, it can thrive. And for, for whatever reason, um, Jewish people traditionally, historically, have been the object of hatred. It's, it's, it's been the case for so long that I think in some ways it just seems to be ingrained, whether it's culturally or socially. Um, I, I, the, and the reasons for it, I mean, obviously we can look at, at the birth of Christianity. Um, we can look at uh, the fact that Jews were exiled from, uh, from what was their traditional homeland in Israel and became wanderers uh, in different communities. Uh, and the fact that they were traditionally successful uh, and therefore uh, there was a lot of resentment toward them. I think all these things sort of play into a tradition, a long tradition of hatred toward Jews uh, which is abroad, which is out there, and which, when you get people who are disillusioned and want to find uh, a reason for their problems, 
often will simply look at the protocols of the elders of Zion, or uh, the rantings of George Lincoln Rockwell, or uh, Mein Kampf, or whatever it is, and for some reason that gives them the answer to, to all the things that, that troubles them. Uh, I was just reading last night after uh, dinner with Professor Mickman and I had a long conversation in our hotel lobby, and then afterward I, I wanted to do a little bit of research. Um, Christopher Browning is one of the great uh, scholars on the Holocaust, and I was reading some of his his work on the internet uh, related to uh, the uh, origins of the final solution. Um, and um, I, I urge you to read his books on, on the origins of, of the final solution, but um, it, it was, uh, it, it, it's a complex thing. He talks in Germany about the failure of, of Germany to uh, grasp and, and, and appreciate all of the Enlightenment. It only got part of the Enlightenment, the rational and the scientific and the organized part of the Enlightenment, but not the personal freedoms and not the, uh, the ennobling of the human soul. Um, and so uh, groundwork was laid for someone like human, Adolf Hitler to come in and use hatred to, uh, to attract a following, and, and that led to the Holocaust. So um, you know, we could talk about this for the next few days, being in this conference room, uh, and I think it's a noble inquiry, and I think we should continue to talk about it. But people like Cobb, he's just one of those people who was looking for answers, one of those individuals who, for some reason, uh, the rhetoric of hatred gave him a sense of energy and purpose. Uh, and unfortunately, there are a lot of him like that out there, and we have to do whatever we can in venues like this to bring light to that and hopefully understand it and end it. And someone is raising a hand. I, I want to I want to challenge you. Yes. So I have to get another allergies for both my voices. So it's, this is an important issue which should not be taken lightly. Yes. I think your exploration of it is uh, very methodical, very clear, and I appreciate it. And you're saying things that I, we all agree with. Um, people are turning to the protocols of the elders of Zion, people, when, when the, if the economic system here crumbles, uh, these guys are laying the foundation. But the fact is, in the world today, there are societies and states crumbling. And the vacuum that is being filled by this collapse are people using the protocols of the others in Zion. These social movements are taking control of states. They're taking control of militaries. They're operating on the battlefield, massacring people as we speak, causing millions of people to become refugees. And yet, the intellectuals in this country, predominantly, the media of record, predominantly, and the government of the United States, as well as other governments, are engaging in relations, are training them to run elections, are funding them, are arming them in some cases, and in the case of some regimes. What, what are these regimes, Charles? Well, let's talk about the support of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Training to run in elections, funding, which is now, uh, I'd say, common knowledge. Um, turning a blind eye to the worsening situation in Syria, which I think... I don't mean to interrupt you, but the Muslim Brotherhood is not in control in Egypt. They're not in control now, but they, they were. Right. They, well, were they, they were, but they've been, they've been taken out of control. And they've but been the president is still back there. wanted them not to be out of control. But my, my point is that the Obama administration funded their training to run in the election. And continues to. This, these are facts. This is not I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know that you're challenging me, though, because I, you, I think these are all points along the same continuum. I, my question will challenge you, so okay. if I may. Sure. And, and what I find, and I, I'm going to challenge you further, because this is the, this is the discourse. I like challenge. It's good. good. Let's bring it on. So this is the discourse in this country. And I find it extraordinarily alarming. Extraordinarily alarming. What is the discourse? I'm sorry. The discourse is this. The discourse is right now we're entering into the discourse because now we're getting a little tested, right? I, you're a no worries. Here. I respect your work and I know you respect my work. And my friend. No worries at all. Absolutely. But we, we're entitled we're, to disagree if we do. But the fact is, I haven't asked my question, so we can't disagree. He's <laughs> <laughs> playing the trap. I'm about to get ambushed. Yeah, I mean, I'm ambushed. But what I find 
troubling is, for example, when, when Khomeini, the leader of the revolution, the leader of the revolution now, the media and the administration of the United States and other countries as well, is, is portraying this uh, new leader, prime minister as moderate, but we know the regime hasn't changed in the long period. Yeah. But the media blitz has, and the PR blitz that is very prevalent in this country is portraying the regime as shifting it up to the leader of the Indonesia. 18 hours before the Obama administration signed an interim agreement with the regime, the leader of the regime said that the Jews and the Zionists and the Israelis are going to be obliterated and they are dogs. Dogs that will be obliterated. And 18 hours later, without a word, the Obama administration and five European countries signed an agreement. Now, there may be many geopolitical considerations, but I am not a scholar of or aware of or a policymaker of both. But when human rights is so detached from policy, that when a, when a regime threatens genocide, incites the genocide, as you are an expert on, and we say nothing, and these are people that have their fingers on, on power, on, on military power, economic power, oil, and they're trying to get a nuclear weapon. When we remain silent, whether we're Republican or Democrat, whether we're American or European, what have we learned? You know, so I agree with your analysis of this wholeheartedly. And, you know, and thank God that these guys are kind of relatively marginalized they're small now, but they, you never know how things change in the future, and they are probably trying to lay the groundwork. But there are people with this ideology, with their fingers on power, which our government is uh, refusing to label uh, who they are and what they're trying to achieve. And even in the past week, Kerry threatened the ADL and the Israeli government perceived, perceived Kerry as threatening uh, the boycott movement on Israel if they don't do certain things. So my question is, why the silence in the United States? Because it's not like that um, in the Jewish community in Canada and among human rights activists and scholars. There are people in Europe who, who speak of very clearly about this, but I find in the United States up until now there is a silence and there is uh, I would even say a tendency to label those who bring up the issue as being Bush supporters or neoconservatives or Islamophobic. There's a silence. And when and why can't we have an exchange of ideas and a debate about ideas? And why the silence in this country? What to go correctly. Are you done? <laughs> I just want to make sure because I no, I know okay. that's it's a that's a long I want to I try to try to make sure I, I've got it all down. Here, here's why I don't think you challenged me, and here's why I think there's a, an essential link between what I talked about today and what you just said. Let's just focus on the Iranian regime, because I think that's, uh, and, and we are in full agreement that it is a, a horrible regime, uh, human rights violators, uh, and potentially uh, global destabilizers, if they're not already doing it, um, that, that's, that's what I think they want to do. Um, my point is that, if you will, um, these pioneer little Europe movements, what they would like is uh, the Nazi version of the Iranian regime uh, to be uh, installed here in the United States. So what I'm doing is, what I'm saying is, look, we, we totally agree about that. I don't see any disagreement. I'm not really not even understanding it. Um, I'm just saying that this is something that is more in the shadows. ISCAP's doing a great job of bringing up this issue. This is, this is an issue that you talk about all the time. I have done it on your behalf. And I agree with you. You know that my work supports exactly what you said in terms of the Iranian regime engaging in incitement, genocidal incitement. But we just finished. I'm sorry. But, but we're, uh, you know, I'd like to think that ISGAP is doing wonderful things. We're trying. ISGAP is doing wonderful but things. But we're, in, to be honest, we're in the wilderness. We're on the margins. You well, but are in the margins. But but I think it's important, though, and I appreciate having the, the audience that I've had the last couple of days to bring up something that you're not talking about that I think is related. And the whole point is we're trying to think about these issues on a deeper level. This is the same on a, on a deeper level. This is the same kind of people. These are the same kinds of elements that go into the Iranian regime. Hateful, intolerant, brutal people who would love to take control, take power. You're right. You know, they, they are controlling things in Iran right now. Um, I cannot tell you how much I hope 
that the Islamic Republic collapses. Uh, but I don't want to see uh, an enclave in this country. Uh, you know, in 2008, we almost had an economic collapse in this country. We were on the, we were on the, on the doorstep of the Great Depression. This, these kind of groups, that's what they're waiting for. And whether it's the, what you call them, Stanistans, and, Stanistan, yeah, and, 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 these, and these pioneer little Europe movements and, and, and all the rest that we have here in this country that are, that are poised to, 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 to try to gain power as, as, any way they can if, if, if we have a collapse, that that is essentially what you have had happen in Iran. You know, Iran, if you look at the history of Iran uh, and, the, and the Shah, and frankly the support that the United States gave the Shah and the, the things that were going on there uh, that led to the Islamic Revolution, stupid policies on the United States part, and, and banana republic politics of the CIA uh, in the 1940s and the 1950s, that should have been prevented. What I'm talking about, Charles, is preventing these things from happening. We, all, we can all agree that, that a regime like, like the Islamic Republic that already exists is, is as dangerous as it gets and shouldn't be on the global stage. I wholeheartedly agree with you on that. But let's not allow something like this that hasn't happened yet to take place. And that's why I'm here. Um, you, you, you're talking about valid issues, but I wanted to come in and bring a, a viewpoint of another issue that I think, if we're talking about comparative anti-Semitism, we should be talking about. So I'll challenge you one more. One You're more not time. challenging me. I will. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. The silence on radical Islam, not Islam, not Muslims, but radical political Islam by the Obama administration, the silence, um, putting the address on the, the assassination of Osama bin Laden and saying that's the end of Al-Qaeda, that's the end of radical Islam, and being, and being a portraying a caricature. But I think last week in France, it points to the devastation of not only Nazism, but radical Islam. We had 17,000 people marching the streets of Paris, white national supremacist fascists like these characters in North Carolina, yeah, right. with marginalized, radical, West African men, Muslim extremists, young African black young men, Marching with white supremacists. Exactly what I said to you. Screaming, ago. yeah, screaming. Uh, That's you're Zionist making my point. Zionist. I still don't see you, you challenging me. I see you well, reinforcing no, what I'm so, saying. So I, so I know we're in agreement, but but the, the the challenge is, how do we end the silence in this country when it comes to radical Islam? Because the extreme right, even though they're racist, and the extreme green, they're they're coming together. They're working together in many many spaces and many places, and I'm afraid that it's, it's happening here. And the message that we're beaming out to the world in the Middle East, I think, is, is quite dangerous. Our silence is very dangerous. That may, that may very well be, but I don't see why that should mean that I shouldn't be talking about something that's happening that. in the heart of this country I never that concerns that. me. Great. No, no, I mean, I, I, I agree. The point is that we don't want these hate mongers to be able to gain power and to be able to link up and, and create a power base. That's, that's why I say the, the bigger theme we're in complete agreement on. I, I, I don't. I don't. See, I mean, I, I completely see that and agree. And I'm worried about that. I think he was placing an unfair burden on you. you I don't think he was placing any burden on me. I, I don't. I, 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 I mean, I think we're. You weren't talking about the whole world. We're, right. We're not even in the same room in a way. I mean, I, 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 we're in agreement. Yes. The American National Fund in the 1930s. Yes. Presented a bigger threat to the United States than the people that you're going after right now. And, if, and also, I want, I want to agree with this lady sitting over here, is uh, so far, we've had more terrorist attacks from the Muslims in America than we've had from the uh, Nazi movement. Well, America. other than clothing, fashion. They, they impact a lot of fashion. Well, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not here on behalf of the Southern Poverty Law Center, but I, but I can tell you that there have been horrible acts of violence that have been committed by these neo-Nazis. Um, I was going to put some of that actually into this, but I, I, I was limited on time yesterday, and, and, I, and I didn't want to take too much time today. But well, I mean, there, there, there are murders. I mean, there are murders that are taking place by these groups uh, all the time. Um, it's all bad. I mean, I, I just don't. Why should we be saying, oh, and the Bund in the 1930s? Um, Actually, in, in many ways, because the United States at that time was so aware of the threat of Hitler, uh, the Bund was very quickly marginalized in the 1930s. Um, and and uh, the Bund leaders were, 
were, were actually arrested because we had a war at that time and, uh, and these people were aiding and comforting the enemy. Um, so um, I think what, what's, what's more disturbing about this, the Bund, if you will, were kind of the, 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 the Hitlerites, they represented Hitler, they, they said that they were ambassadors of Hitler. What worries me about somebody like Scoop and the National Socialist Movement is that they understand that they can, they can appeal to youths, they can use the internet, they can use rock music, they can use all these media, and they're doing it. And um, I just think it's, it's a mistake we overlook. Yes? Um, two things that I could add, I'm not going to challenge you, that I can add to what you're saying is that I, th I think there's a bifurcation. In addition to hatred, there is also fear. The white supremacist groups and the Nazi groups and such like people are very frightened of being supplanted by the bugaboo of whatever group they hate might be taking over for them, uh, the people in Oregon and Washington State. Those people are very fearful of their puissance disintegrating. Also, there's a very big tie-in in general, with conspiracism in general, conspiracism comforts you by saying, that's the explanation of all the bad stuff, the conspiracy. He did that. He killed the JFK. That's, that's Browning. Right. That's what Browning was, when oh. I was reading Browning last night. That's okay. right. Because yeah. conspiracism explains so much and is very fearsome to me because you look at 9-11 and there are still people who are saying, it was Bush. He did that to, you know, to get in war. You know, and, and you don't know what to say to such people. The same as you don't really know. I, I taught in China. I taught in college in China. And there was um, a fellow I met who called himself Messerschmitt because he was a Chinese fellow and you always take an English name. He took the English name of Messerschmitt to be his English name. Sounds and then German to me. <laughs> exactly, but he was not that with, witty you know, or with him. Right. But he would constantly have Hitler in front of me and the other teachers would say, stop it, she's Jewish. You're not funny. It's not funny. But his conspiracy things was that he, if he emulated the Germans, if he emulated them, he could then conquer all the threats around him, and he was afraid of many, many things. And I think conspiracy goes far, as, as Browning obviously That's right. Said. And these hate, these hate groups, there, there are linkages. And I appreciate uh, Blake's question about whether, you know, on an international, uh, national level, that, that there are linkages. I think, I think there are. I also think, frankly, that these radical Islamist groups would, would absolutely find common cause with these neo-Nazi groups. Uh, again, the image of Hitler with the Grand Mufti, I think, is a powerful one and one that we should be we should be concerned about. Um, Anti-Semitism can take many forms, and it can manifest itself in, in different places and times and, and ways. Um, the point of this, and I think the reason we study anti-Semitism, the reason that this institute exists, is to look at the different manifestations the different times, the different places, and understand where the common links are. That is how we can best get, get to the bottom of this problem and find ways to solve it. Because that's what I'm here for, and that's why I believe there's no challenges here, there's just common cause. Let's end the scourge of anti-Semitism, let's get together and think about how we can best do that in its many forms, um, and this wonderful seminar series is dedicated to doing that, and so I'm honored to be here, I appreciate Charles having me, and um, uh, I, I thank you for being here today. So, I'll, I'll end by saying, <laughs> good to have you again. And uh, thank, you, thank you for your important work. Appreciate your research and career research. This is a little bit of a divergence from what I normally do, but it, it's linked in many ways. But I'll I tell you, I'm going to tell you one thing, one point of information. The reason why this gap exists, this stuff is very important. I don't want to minimize it at all in, in any sense. However, in 1996, in Ramallah, I became friendly with a guy from Islamic Jihad. I was doing work with Israeli and Palestinian scholars. And I met a guy, a very nice guy, very cultured guy, and I became friends with him. And he started to explain his ideology and his culture. And I went to grade schools, I went to McGill, University of London, Oxford, traveled the world. I had no clue, no inkling of where this guy was coming from and knew nothing about his worldview. And after, my initial reaction was to argue with him. But then I stopped arguing, I started to learn, I started to listen, I started to read. And the reason why ISGAP exists is to ring an alarm bell as loud as we can with the highest level of scholarship and intellectual activity possible to shift the way scholars deal with this issue, ignore this issue, 
the way the media ignores it, and the way policymakers in the West have been ignoring it and pushing, kicking the can down the road. And I hope that this job is successful, that we will wake up people to this horrific, terrifying scourge of people using anti-Semitism to gain support to push an agenda which is anti-human rights, anti-democratic. Same things all over again. There we go. We've seen it all over. Let's let's stop it. <laughs> <laughs>